department teaching American colonial history, history of the 20th century, um, and then of course on the social history of baseball, talking about how history uh, paralleled the rise of our national pastime. So I've come to the Institute a couple of times and talked about um, Thomas Jefferson. Last year we did a, a program on Jackie Robinson, who I think is probably one of the most, if not the most important person in the history of the game. And Tony Canigliaro, another uh, member of our beloved Red Sox team. But Ted Williams stands alone when we talk about the history of the Red Sox. And he's just a very unique character. Um, and so this title is called Obsession, Ted Williams' Quest for Perfection. And Williams could be described as stubborn, immature, intolerable, cruel, um, and, but he's also considered the greatest hitter that ever lived. And he had this one singular goal. And his daughter Claudia said it, he took one aspect of the game and he perfected it. His goal was to be the greatest hitter that ever lived. And he achieved that goal. And how many people in their lives actually set a goal and achieve it? He's a legend, he's a baseball legend, he's a, a hero, he's a Red Sox, he's a Marine. And Theodore Samuel Williams is just so much more. And what I like about Williams is that he never shied from a challenge and greatness never does. And when we talk about a legend, a legend is proper, uh, popularly regarded as a historical, although not verifiable person or thing that inspires legends, a baseball legend, and that's from the dictionary. And when we think about Williams, he is definitely falls into that category. I think a lot of you know the, the movie of um, The Natural, uh, the legendary literary character who was a baseball nomad. Okay, something just happened. Okay, sorry about that. Let's, um, huh. okay, let's, um, okay, I think we just lost that. Let's go back to this. There we go. The literary character and a baseball nomad who burst onto the baseball stage and his bats are mythical. Now he wears number nine like Williams, bats from the left like Williams, bats in the third in the batting order. And actually when Redford was making the movie, he sought Ted Williams. And um, here we go again, okay. And asked for his help to be um, an advisor to the movie. And um, Williams declined, but he, he loved it. He did like the movie. He just recognized that there were some flaws. And um, Williams really appreciated this whole mythical image of the baseball player, Roy Hobbs. And like Hobbs in the movie, Williams, when you do research and you do reading and you watch video, I truly believe that he could hit whatever he wanted. He wanted to hit a double, he'd hit a double. If he needed a home run to win the game, he'd hit a home run. And Williams had terrific eyesight. He had 2015 eyesight. Now, perfect eyesight is 2020. He had 2015. So think about how he could see the depth of the baseball when it was coming in. Ted Williams was definitely a complex person. He wasn't, he, wasn't, he wasn't just a baseball player. He was a father. He was a great fisherman. He was a salesman for Moxie. He was a legend. He's a Hall of Famer. He's a war hero. He's a Marine. Very proud of all of that. And, and I'm going to paraphrase here from Ben Barley Jr.'s wrote a great book called The Kid. And, and, and Ted Williams really is the first latchkey kid. Um, he had a very difficult childhood. His father was more or less an absentee father and his mother, who was considered the saint of her, her neighborhood, was involved with the Salvation Army. And if I were to describe Ted Williams' childhood, I would say that it was one that was very bleak. He and his brother would come home to an empty house, his brother Danny, and there'd be nobody home. And they'd be stuck on the porch waiting to get in the house and they're usually home um, hungry, coming home hungry, having nothing to eat. Ted spent his days at, the, at the, uh, the park. He spent his days fishing, hunting jackrabbits, and looking after his younger brother. And this all plays into who Williams is. We all know about Williams' short temper, his fight with the press, his, his argument, his fighting with the fans. And it's said that the lack of parental emotion and the attachment also affects children as they become defensive and big. And as grown-ups, this unconsciously is triggered 
by the emotional childhood isolation. And think about that for Williams coming home and no one's there and asking, do you really love me? Do you care for me? And according to child counselor Damien Muzan in the book, The Secrets of Staying in Love, and now another aspect of isolation is being unable to, ha to have form healthy relationships. Williams was married three times and he had three children. He admitted that he struck out as a, as a husband and he struck out as a parent. He wasn't the best husband and he wasn't the best parent. Um, Williams had three children, John Henry, um, Barbara Joyce and Claudia. He was born in August of 1918 and passed away in uh, July of 2002. Williams utilized his insecurities to, to really succeed. And his mother, May, who you see in the picture there with his brother Danny, was really a cult of personality. May was Mexican-American, and that was something that was a fact that Williams kind of shunned. His mother was a saint of her hometown, and she was completely devoted to the Salvation Army. And, and Williams said that home for him was not a happy place. His mother didn't keep a, a really good home. It wasn't clean, and he was perf you know, a perfectionist. He always wanted a house to be clean. Williams loved his parents, but could not count on them. That love, support, and um, direction that all children need from a nuclear family didn't exist for, for Williams and his brother. And he, he talks about that in his great book, Only Me. Uh, his mother would later help him negotiate his contracts, and, the, and um, Williams would be his mother's benefactor. His parents never went to see him play baseball. So think about that, that you have this young boy who finds something, finds a task that he's really good at as a goal, I'm gonna be the greatest that I've ever lived. And goes from Hoover High School, he was also a pitcher and he's very successful. Goes plays for the San Diego Padres in the Pacific Coast League. Gets signed by the Boston Red Sox. Has this terrific career. Parents never watch the game. That's gonna be devastating. We know when we talk about sports that practice is, practice makes, or perfect practice makes perfect. And Williams was always seeking to uh, improve himself. Beyond baseball, he loved the movies, reading about George Washington, Napoleon, and, and Lindbergh as a kid. Another passion of his was, was shooting marbles. But it was um, his determination really to be the best came from his mother. And he said that his mother was just like that, trying to save souls. Now, a goal, is it a goal or an obsession? Williams would say that a man has to have goals for a day or for a lifetime. And that was mine to have people say, there goes Ted Williams, the greatest ever that, that ever lived. And there was a story that as a little boy, Williams would be laying on the grass, hands behind his back, looking at a shooting star. And he would sit there somewhere in a park in San Diego, wishing that, you know, I want to make it. I want to be the greatest hitter that ever lived. So what is the difference? What's the difference between a goal and an obsession? And a goal is the object of a person's ambition or effort and aims the desired result. Or an obsession is an idea or a thought that it continually preoccupies or intrudes a person's mind. In, in how many people set their mind to accomplish that one particular goal? Williams, again, to, to his daughter's point, took that one aspect of the game. Now you need to run, you need to catch, you need to throw, and you need to hit. And he perfected it. He talked about hitting incessantly. He boned his bat. So what I mean by that was he got his baseball bat and he got a, a meat bone and he rubbed it against it. He heated his bats to try to get the moisture out of it. He weighted his bats. So anyone playing baseball at that time would look at him and say, this guy's a crackpot. He was odd. He was different. Now today they talk about when you swing the bat, swing it on an upswing. Get that ball in the year. For so long, it was always a level swing, and the trajectory of the ball would go up. Williams was talking about swinging in an upswing since the day he started. So he was way ahead of his game, way ahead of his time. The goal for him was always the perfect swing in practice. And you have to have great discipline to perfect something. And whether he admitted it or not, his discipline came from his mother. And Ted was the polar opposite of his brother, Danny, who got in trouble all the time, no discipline, and didn't really have that outlet that Ted did with sports. And he would practice his swing constantly in the bathroom, in the locker room, in his underwear, hold the newspaper as a bat. And according to his daughter, Claudia, baseball was a metaphor for Williams. And that ball represented life. Absentee parents, fans booing at him, sports writers needling him, et cetera. 
and why not hit the hell out of that baseball? Why not look at that baseball that's coming at you 90 plus miles an hour and croaking it, croaking it to left field at Fenway Park or the short pension, porch at Yankee Stadium to beat the rival Yankees. And to be a good hitter, you need to have patience. You need to have patience. And Williams, when I keep saying that he's a complex man, Williams is also a fisherman. Now, I just, myself, I've just picked it up. It's, it's, a, it's a great escape. It really is. It's something to, to, to be there, uh, listening to water and looking and observing what's around you. But it's not something that's going to happen right away. You cast and you just wait. You just wait and you wait. And fishing gives you patience. Now, you can see behind me is Ted Williams with the strike zone. He knew the strike zone better than anyone. And the umpires would defer to him a lot as he matured in his career. Fishing gives you the pa forces you to have patience. And Williams was patient at the bat. And when he would stand up at bat, he was patient. He was going to hit the ball his pitch. He was going to make the pitcher throw him his pitch to hit. And fishing helped give him that patience. After high school and after the Red Sox uh, signed him, his first road to the majors was his first stop was Minneapolis where he met his first wife. It was a after his stellar season with the San Diego Padres. Um, Williams dominates this league in 1938. His batting average is 366. He has 43 home runs and 142 RBIs and, and wins the American Association Triple Crown. The Triple Crown, imagine that, his first professional year. Two important things happened to Ted. So he struck in the head for the first time, and that, that ever happened to him. So he had to prove to himself that he could get back in there. Now, when we talked about Tony Canigliaro uh, a year ago, we know that when Canigliaro, who got hit in the eye, and he was right-handed hitter, whereas Williams is lefty, Canigliaro, and we saw it on tape, said that he needed to get back in the box, that he couldn't be afraid to get back in there. That was important. If he was going to be successful, if he was going to get back to the majors, he had to get back in the box. And it was the same thing with Williams. It's a psychological issue. So Williams got hit in the head. And they didn't have helmets back then in 1938. He was just wearing his cap. And he had to prove to himself that he could get back in. And he began to use a lighter bat. Now, a lot of power hitters, which Williams was, were using um, heavier bats. You know, Hank Greenberg. Babe Ruth, Jimmy Fox, all the power hitters at that time. Williams was like, no, I think it's more important to have the speed in the control of the bat. So I'm going to go with a lighter bat. And he started that long before it became the norm. It's Williams that starts using the lighter bat. He soon joined uh, by his Padre team at Bobby Door, and they both end up, Door gets to Boston before he does. And um, Williams' first professional home run in the Red Sox uniform is at Holy Cross in Worcester. 1939, Williams arrives, and he arrives in a big way. His rookie campaign is the stuff of legend. And no one had ever compiled these uh, statistics that Williams did in 1939, and no one ever else has. 372 batting average, 145 runs batted in, 31 home runs, 107 walks, 344 total bases. 436 on base percentage for a rookie, 609 slugging, and he won the unofficial as a 20 year old rookie of the year award. And no rookie has ever come to that perfection. And as a 20 year old in 1939, he's in the same discussion about Hall of Fame is like Gehrig, Jimmy Fox, Greenberg, and the great DiMaggio. So from 1939 to 43, Williams was American League royalty and was the cornerstone to a uh, competitive Red Sox team. Now, we know that Williams' greatest season is 1941. His uh, 42 season, 1941, his 22 year old season. And, um, you know, in a great book that he has uh, written by John Underwood. It's, it's only me, Ted Williams. I was going to read something from this about this 41 season. 
in Underwood says that 406 is taking a distant aura, like a planet, an accomplishment of unapproachable brilliance, as if it were done by Ram, Rembrandt instead of a skinny kid from San Diego. Now, to hit 400, that means that out of 10 times, you've got to get on base. You've got to get out of base four times out of 10. Think how difficult that is. Now, if you got a, you got a guy that's hitting in the twos, anything over 260, you're going to be like, well, this, you know, we got to find here. You know, and there's some of the really good ball players like Mookie Betts and, um, you know, J.D. Martinez, not necessarily this year, but hit over 300. Williams is hitting four. He gets up to up, up about 10 times. He's getting at least four hits each time. And he's only 22. His statistics were 120 RBI. He only trailed only trailing Joe DiMaggio. He had 37 home runs, which he led the American League. He had a 23-game hitting streak compared to DiMaggio's 56 game. And he slugged over 700, both at Fenway and away. He hit 428 at Fenway Park. And um, his only time that he had a hitless streak was only at seven at-bats. Okay? Now, since 1941, since this happened, Rod Carew in 1977 hit 388. George Brett in that great season, 1980, I remember that. He hit 390. Tony Gwynn in the shot, the strike shot in the year uh, of 1994, hit 394. I remember when they canceled the World Series and they canceled the season and Gwynn sitting in the dugout crying. I'll never forget that. And then Ted Williams, <coughs> excuse me, 1957, 388. And, you know, the funny thing is, is that Williams, his goal was never to hit 400. It was to be a 400 hitter. There's a difference there. There's a difference. And what I like, again, what I said about, about earlier about Williams is that he never shied from, um, from a challenge. So going into the last game, the two games of the season, there was a doubleheader against the Kansas City A's. His batting average was 0.3995 which would have been rounded off to 400. And his manager at the time, uh, Hall of Famer Joe Cronin, they pulled Williams aside and said, listen, kid, you don't, you know, take the, weight, take the day off. Take the, you know, you don't have to play. Why don't you sit out and everything's rest assured. And um, Williams wasn't going to have anything about it. And he's like, and if I'm going to hit 400, I'm going to earn it. And this was a game, two games against the uh, Kansas City A's, were a second division American League team. And uh, the umpire, when Williams approached him, says, you know, uh, Bill McGowan said to him that, you know, in order to fit 400, you get to be loose. And that helped Williams. And the catcher said to Williams, he goes, listen, Mr. Mack told, you, told us not to give you anything today. So they weren't going to waste pitches on Williams. And Williams went six for eight. He didn't go two for eight. He went six for eight. So out of eight times a bat, he got six hits. Six hits. Never shying away from a, um, from a challenge. And that's what I appreciated about Williams. So there's this great hope, and the Red Sox really have a, a really good core. They have Don DiMaggio in center field, Ted Williams in left. They have Johnny Pesky, a young uh, pesky shot stop and uh, shot stop playing uh, great baseball tremendous for a rookie season in 42 Bobby Dua, steady hand hall of famer at second base other players and then world war ii hits and williams finishes out the 42 uh, season and joins the navy and becomes a marine aviator and like many during world this time williams would serve uh, from 1942 to 1945 and he would lose three prime years um, of his career uh, during this whole period of time. In 1946, everyone comes back, and the Red Sox really are primed to, to be the great team. And uh, they win the American pennant. They cru cruise through the, the 46 season. They win 154 games, losing 50, and were first in the American League. Williams wins his first American League MVP. Uh, pitcher Tex Hudson goes over, wins 20 games. Dave Boo Boo Ferris wins 25. Mickey Harris wins 17. And Joe Dobson wins 17. 
Um, and we know the story. They unfortunately lose the, um, to the St. Car- Louis Cardinals in seven games. In Williams, and you can see his stats for his, for his MVP, 342 batting average, 38 home runs, 123 RBIs. In, in the seven games in the World Series, he hit only 200, had five hits, no, no home runs, and one RBI. And this would haunt him his entire career and his life, that he only got one chance. And, you know, they had a very good Red Sox team. And the, the team with the best record went into the World Series. There were no playoffs at that time, not like the, there are today, or at least divisions like they have in the last 50 years. And prior to the um, World Series, they uh, played a team, the Red Sox played a team of American League All-Stars, and Williams got hit on the elbow, and the elbow uh, kind of ballooned. But he never used that as, ex- as an excuse, to his credit, that, um, you know, he just – he, he admitted that he was lousy. And, um, you know, you see these, DiMaggio had multiple opportunities. Mickey Mantle had opportunities. Williams, he only had one opportunity. Cleveland, um, the Cleveland Indians, who were a really good competitive team, managed under Lou Boudreau at the time, uh, did the shift. Now, we know the shift that takes place to every Frank Owner during his tenure, but the Red Sox would complain about it. And, um, you know, it starts – moving these ball players to try to uh, entice Williams. And Williams still beat them. Think about that, okay? During this shift, 78 at-bats, hits 20, has 20 runs, 30 hits, 11 home runs, and 28 IBIs. Like I said earlier, never shying away from a challenge. The Red Sox are once again a great team in 1948, 1949 but finished respectively uh, in second place behind the, uh, the great Cleveland Indians team of 48 that wins the World Series. And then uh, what David Hollistram wrote a terrific book in the summer of 49. Um, they, beat, they lose to the Yankees the last series of the season. Uh, Williams wins his second American League MVP, has 194 hits, 43 home runs, 59 RBI, 343 batting average, and 650 slugging. So all this acclaim and all this aura of Williams, he's living and fulfilling this um, potential. By the 1950s, the Red Sox really are, you know, a, a more or less a second, perennial second division team. After 1950, they're not that very competitive. Williams would again lose time to the military service and would be voted by his peers as the player of the decade. So think about it. He goes to Korea, and we're going to talk about that. Loses a couple more years but still voted the player of the decade over Mantle, DiMaggio, Stan Usual, um, and others. It's Williams who's voted the player. Williams would have no equal in his career during that period would become legendary. And, um, you know, he's a batting champion in 1957 with a 388 um, batting average. At th- uh, 1958, 328 batting average. He's an all-star the entire decade. Uh, first on on-base percentage five times during the decade. He hit a total of 227 home runs during the decade. And he again loses um, two years to military service. So when, when looking, at, looking at the stars of that period and, and, and other sports, in thinking about William's perfection, the only person that I could find, and I think that he's kind of, could be con- his counterpart, would be Ben Hogan. One of the greatest golfers of all time, if not the greatest golfer. Hall of Famer, Masters Champion in 51, 53, PGA Championships in 46 and 48, U.S. Open Champion 48, 50, 51, 53. Fourth all time in wins. And Hogan is considered the, one of the greatest, if not the greatest, in his respective sport, which is professional golf. And like Williams, Hogan is notable for his profound influence on the golf swing theory in his legendary ball striking ability. So when we talk about Williams, his counterpart is Ben Hogan. They, he focused on swing ability, just like Ted Williams. And it's the tireless goal of perfection. And you can see the image of, of Williams straight up and down 
in Hogan looking like he's swinging when you when you practice golf is swing through a pane of glass. And while in ben Williams we see balance and fall through that remind that reminds someone of a bobble pole, whereas w Hogan we see a downward swing, and like I said, swinging through a pane of glass. And for Ben Hogan it was the perfect swing. He was pr practicing like Williams day and night, day and night, going to the golf course when everybody else is having cocktails at the, uh, the 19th hole, Hogan's out there with a cigarette in his mouth, just hitting, chipping, chipping, practicing putting, driving. And Hogan, like Williams, was a master of it. And they were both tireless workers. Williams, you know, by this time, and you take a look at this picture, he's the old veteran and is recognized as the greatest singer that ever lived. And, and, and there's just so many similarities between Williams and, and Hogan. And Hogan also had a, you know, lost a couple of prime years during to military service in World War II. So there's those parallels. Um, Hogan lost his father to suicide at a very young age. So that left an indelible mark on um, who Hogan was and his goal to be the best of all time. And uh, we know about that famous car accident that um, Hogan almost never walked again. And uh, he never, you know, walked a golf course without pain and would have to soak his legs in ice. They both uh, wrote guides to perfection. Hogan's Five Lessons was written in 1957, and that's uh, the Bible of, uh, of golf. Um, it's a great read. And then naturally in 1970, um, it's Williams, The Science of Hitting. And each book is considered the de facto book for anyone learning to better themselves in that respective sport. Williams, and that's the image right behind me over here, is you take a look at the strike zone. And um, he is the master. And I said earlier that um, umpires at a certain point would just defer to Williams. Well, if Ted Williams didn't swing at it, then it couldn't have been a strike. And then actually that would infuriate the managers, the catchers in the opposing team. But if you take a look at the image on, on the screen, he shows you that if you have uh, consistent strikes uh, you hit these different colored ball, balls, that's where you'll, um, you'll hit. And each colored ball represents a possible average if you hit it consistently. So he breaks it down, excuse me, to a science. The myth versus reality. He loved being a Marine, excuse me, saying it was the best team he ever played for. He loved the structure and the regiment. Think about that for a kid who had no structure in his life. Um, and he would lose a total of five years to military service. No other athlete enjoyed that. And that goes always to the what if factor. We talked about that with, with um, Tony Canigliaro. Canigliaro had never got hurt. We know what he would have done uh, in his career. Well, think about the five years that, that Williams missed, averaging 30, 36 to 38 home runs in every season. And think about that. Um, he was a great pilot. And uh, future astronaut John Glenn said that Williams was his best wingman. And I, I put uh, the picture of John Wayne there because Ted Williams was John Wayne. Ted Williams was the character that John Wayne played in the movies. So Ted Williams was real hero. Um, Williams was, uh, a, like I said, a complex man and he's the defiant one and feuded with the press uh, many times and it might possibly cost him a couple of uh, MVPs. Um, when he suffered a sophomore slump, his second season, the Boston Press got on him and, um, you know, for not being superhuman. And he was only the bright spot for that, those, those Red Sox teams. Um, his lack of emotional control throughout his career could be a, a lack of nurturing a relationship with parents. Um, parenting is so important, and he didn't have that. Um, he felt abandoned. He loved his parents, but he didn't feel the, the mutual love from them. And he didn't have that parental direction to show him how to act, uh, how to be mature, how to act around other people. Um, in, the bio in the biography, Lefty Grove, an American original, Jim Kaplan wrote that Williams was also victimized by a cutthroat press. Of course they were. And think about it. Well, Williams was playing. You, you, you had multiple newspapers representing the six New England states. In the Boston Globe, in the Herald, had two editions per day. So Williams was the only game in town. 
Yeah, the Bruins here were here. They weren't that really good during the 40s and 50s. The Celtics really don't dominate until after Williams is gone. The Patriots don't exist until 1960. It's Ted Williams. So all New England's hopes and dreams rest on this guy. And he is a hero. He's a pilot. He hit 406. He's superhuman. Columnist, uh, Bill, uh, Boston columnist Bill Cunningham wrote that Williams took his brutal and his cruel cuffing from some elements of the sports press as a kid was ever called upon to suffer. Whether he lacked it for it or not, he got it. And it was ne- there was never anything in modern times exactly like it, which is unfortunate because they didn't see the other side of Tim Williams. And Williams was a tireless advocate for the Jimmy Fund, which is the uh, charitable organization of, for the Boston Red Sox. He raised money and spent countless hours at the Dana Farber Institute with children. Um, he was known to go in there. He wouldn't tell anyone, no photographs, um, and be there and just help these kids. And that would get him angry that these kids had to suffer. And he didn't want to see anyone suffer. And uh, he made sure that his, his visits were never recorded. Uh, September 28th, 1960, Hub Kids fan, Hub fans, kid, big kid to do. Uh, it's the famous story by author John, John Updike. Uh, talks about a hero ending his career. And at 1960, at 42 years old, he hit 316 for a year with tw- 29 home runs. Um, attendance was about 10,454. Uh, Think about that. The Red Sox had an unprecedented run of sellouts. Now with the Green Monster, um, they're probably about over, let's see, probably about 36, 38,000 seats. And it's the hottest ticket in town, even when they're lousy. Ted Williams' last game, the hero of the Boston Red Sox, the man that everyone idolized, just approximately about 10,000 people showed up. It was a dreary day, last game of the season at home, Baltimore Orioles. And, um, we know the story. He uh, hits uh, a home run uh, in his final at bat, a heroic home run. And he runs the bases and doesn't tip his hat, doesn't tip his hat and goes into the dugout. And my beloved mother um, was at that game to see him uh, to, to farewell to, to a great career and to a great season. Williams in 1969 would take over the center of this. So as Richard Nixon starts his term as uh, president of uh, the United States and Vince Lombardi takes over the Washington Redskins. Ted Williams comes out of retirement and manages the, uh, the senators. He was an indifferent manager. He was a manager of the year, three years with the senators, one year when the senators moved to the Texas to become the Rangers, uh, for a little over four, 400 uh, winning percentage, but he was an indifferent manager, um, pretty indifferent. He, he was more focused on hitting, didn't care about fielding drills or pitching, let the coaches take care of that. He just wanted to know what was going on for um, hitting. So, you know, when we, we talk about Williams and he's, he's faded to memory and a lot of the people who had saw him, um, he's beca- his legend continues to grow. And after the, Red, the great success that the Red Sox have had um, over the last 20 years, there's been a lot of talk about who the, Red so- the greatest Red Sox um, player of all time is. And I understand that, you know, with the, with the championships. And when we take a look at this collage of Red Sox players, these are all Hall of Famers. We have Ted, we have Jim Rice, star of the 70s, 78 MVP. We have Trish Speaker, probably the greatest center fielder of all time in baseball. We have Kyle Stremski. Hero of the 67 team, my favorite baseball player. We have Harry Hooper from those, the first dynasty of the Red Sox, Joe Cronin, Pedro Martinez, Lefty Grove, Jimmy Fox, um, Cy Young, and um, Wade Boggs. All Hall of Famers, all worthy Hall of Famers, and all great in their uh, respective times. More recently, a lot of people feel that, uh, you know, David Ortiz, who changed the um, the fortunes of the Red Sox in the early 20th century and is a surefire first ballot Hall of Famer. Um, and you take a look at the stats. Uh, AACLS MVP, 213 World Series MVP, 10-time All-Star, uh, seven Silver Slugging Awards, and 521 career home runs. And think about it, the Red Sox struck gold with, with um, Ortiz. Ortiz had been released by the Twins, and then it was Manny Ramirez and Pedro Martinez who said, you know, let's sign this guy. 
in my, in the, the greatest post post uh, postseason performer of all time, and there is uh, a lot of credibility to to putting him up there, because championships does indicate greatness. But I question that if that's the case, then a case can be said for for Babe Ruth. Um, you know, Babe Ruth was a three-time world champion with the Red Sox long before he was with the Yankees. At that time, he was considered the best left-handed hitter of his era, left-handed pitcher, excuse me, of his era. Um, and, and, and you get to think about Ruth, and he goes into the outfield in 19 before he gets traded. Ruth dominated both as a pitcher and a hitter. So isn't Ruth the greatest player of all time? You take a look at his uh, ERA, he's 219. In six years of pitching, he wins 89, loses 46, 3-0 and in the postseason, 0.87 ERA in the postseason, and is a member of the inaugural Hall of Fame. So if we're going to talk about, if we're going to base greatness of the Red Sox um, on championships, it's got to be Ruth. There is nobody else. It has to be Ruth because of what he could do. But this Williams, you know, Williams was a two-time MVP, two-time triple crown winner, six-time batting champion, 19-time All-Star, lifetime batting average of 344, hit 521 home runs and lost five years to the military and still hit 521 home runs. Voted Sporting News Player of the Decade, the 1950s, and a member of uh, the Hall of Fame. And, and today, when you look at it and you read the books about him, you talk to the people who saw him, he's on that pedestal. And he's become more legendary. And his numbers just speak so loudly. And they, they did an all-century team back in 1999. He was part of that. When they do baseball you know, documentaries and they talk about individual players, he's in the top five of ball players. And it's the Williams, the legend. He's number four for lifetime batting average. Number one in highest career on base percentage. Number one for highest career on base percentage by left-handed hitter. Second in the highest career slugging average. Eight seasons with 30 plus home runs. Four times led the American League in home runs. Four time RBI leader, six time batting champ. And he's right there. He's right there behind Willie and, and Babe and Hank and Mr. Bonds. He's right there with the legendary home run hitters. And, you know, back to who he was, he loved the fish. He loved the fish. And Williams was just as passionate about fishing as he was about baseball. And fishing, fishing gave him that patience. And his laser shop focus allowed him to become a usually successful um, fisherman. And um, he's in two fishing hall of fames, one for salt water and one for fresh water. And um, he would partner with Sears and would be the face of the Sears catalog uh, in the sporting goods, particularly with fishing, for, for many years. And he's a pioneer. And in his induction to the Baseball Hall of Fame, in his uh, induction speech, um, he says that he was an early fan of Shoeless Joe Jackson. We know who Joe Jackson is with uh, the Chicago Black Sox and felt that he should be in the Hall of Fame. But during his acceptance speech in 1966, he shocked everybody where he felt, he strongly felt that um, Negro League players should be did, in tech, uh, inducted into the Hall of Fame as, for, as well. They just didn't have the opportunity. Baseball gives you the opportunity to be better than anybody because it's a level playing field. And we talked about that with Jackie Robinson. That when Jackie Robinson uh, became a first, the first African-American to play baseball, in 1947, in April 1947, it was the first time that it's just a level playing field. Everyone was technically equal. And that's what baseball does. That's why it's the national pastime. And you talk about it and you read about baseball and during the, you know, during the great um, immigration of the late 19th and early 20th century, where you have the German and the Jewish and the Italian and the Irish and the Swedish, all these people that make up the national pastime and continue to do so, it gives you this playing field. And, and William said that I hope that the great players like Josh Gibson and Satchel Payton and the other great Negro League players have the opportunity to get into Hall of Fame because they just weren't given the opportunity. And in 1971, 
they were. And maybe, maybe this idea about discrimination is really a reflection of what William saw as discriminatory acts against his Mexican relatives. He grew up in San Diego and where there's a heavy, a large Mexican Latino population and he saw the discrimination against them. And Williams, when we talk about his greatness and his obsession, was he really a narcissist? And when we talk about Narcissus, he's the Greek mythological figure in love with his reflection. And um, he fell deeply in love with his reflection. And think about that, with Williams looking in the mirror, checking out his swing. So again, is it obsession or is he a, a, a narcissist? Did Williams suffer from OCD? Possibly. It's perfectionism, extreme attention to detail, shows significant rigidity and stubbornness. We know that he was stubborn. Excessive devotion to work at the expense of family and social relationships. I had said that. He admitted that he struck out as a husband and as a father. When you think about it, he went off fishing. Fishing is really something you do by yourself. When you're up at the plate, you're by yourself. Prone to become upset or angry in situations that are unable to maintain control. And John Underwood, his biographer and his friend, said when, when you were dealing with Ted Williams, you had to accept these four things. Number one, he was a relentless perfectionist. Number two, he was better at it than you were, whatever it was. That he was the consummate needler, meaning he would tease you, and that he was in charge. That he was in charge of the conversation. That he was in charge of the kitchen, wherever you might be. It was all about Ted Williams. And you take a look at these images, it's the image of the perfect swing. And yeah, he was a perfectionist. And he worked at it every day. And in, in the documentary, In Search of Greatness, they interviewed Wayne Gretzky, who, you know, the Hockey Hall of Famer, Pele, the hockey, Soccer Hall of Famer, and Jerry Rice, the great receiver for San Francisco Hall of Famer. And they considered the greatest of their respective sports. And each said that hard work and passion played a huge role in who they became. And that is exactly what Williams was, hard work. But there's also the sense of play as a child and how play allowed them the idea of self-discovery in the, the create, to create and fail. So they would talk about practicing in the driveway or practicing at the local park and having that opportunity to play. And when we talk about baseball or any sport, how important the idea of play is to children for creativity and trying new things and being able to fail and uh, succeed at trying again. What might have been, right? The what if equation, missed 727 games during the war service. Definitely won at least won two more MVPs. He averaged 36 home runs in his prime. So he would have had a total of 686 home runs right behind the babe and egg Um And he would have been first in home runs, first in runs, with but he's currently 13 with a total of 2,301. And, and that's the glaring piece in his legend, is the military aspect. And he never really dwelled on it. Um, but if he could, definitely, if he could have had those years back, he, he definitely would have said, yes, I want them back. We look at it, and we look at actual verse adjusted, that just gives you an idea of how many games um, at bats, um, runs, total runs, hits, home runs, and RBI. So if we did that adjustment and put those numbers in and calculated it, um, the adjusted would show you what he would have. Pretty impressive numbers, I would say. Strikeout ratio, after 19 years, uh, he struck out a total of 709 times for an average of 50 per season, which is just, just amazing. Um, you could take a look at Babe Ruth, who was 86. Sam Usual was 37. Hank Aaron is 68. And then the current all-around baseball player was considered a surefire Hall of Famer, Mike Trout. He's played nine years, 108 per season. The 1999 All-Star Game, which I happened to be at, was just a magical time. 
It was the last All-Star game of the 20th century. Um, and it was legendary. It still is considered a legendary All-Star game. And Williams, Williams is the spotlight. It's not the stars that are playing. Um, but it was Williams. In this event, this is the event that cements him as the greatest uh, hitter of all time. It cements the legend, Ted Williams. It was a fantastic night. I was there with my mother, which was great. Um, it was just a magical night. And the announcer's trying to be, I don't know if you've seen the video, I'm sure you have, where he gets driven into the, the, in, into the infield, right around the pitcher's mound, and all the players swarm him. And he's talking to everybody, and Griffey, and McGuire, and Tony Gwynn. And the announcer is asking the players to go back to their respective dugouts. And they're not having any of them. They're sitting there to talk and meet the master, the greatest hitter that ever lived. And everyone said it was just a magical night and what an honor it was to, uh, to meet Ted Williams. And I think that at the end, he did accomplish his goal. It is goal accomplished. Unique. Williams is uh, unique in so many ways. You know, Aaron and, and Ruth, they just wanted to be very good ball players. Um, Aaron took it a little bit more serious than Ruth. But Williams set out to be the greatest hitter that ever lived, and he achieves that goal. And, you know, his childhood dream becomes reality. And that's what separates Williams from everyone else. And, and again, that's why I like him, because he never shied from anything. He took every challenge, whether it was on the baseball field, whether it was flying um, combat missions in Korea, fighting with the press, trying to get that salmon wherever he might be fishing, he took every challenge. And he is the greatest hitter of all time. In the annuals of modern baseball history, he is the last man to hit 400. He is in the top five of the greatest ball players of all time. He is the Major League Baseball all-time team 97. And he is the real John Wayne. He set out to perfect one aspect of the game he loved, and he did it. And he brought discipline to everything he did um, as a marine pilot, as a baseball player, as a fisherman. Was he a good husband? No, he remember that. Was he a good father? He wasn't the best father, he remember that. But at the end of the day, he was perfect anyways. So uh, that's the end of my presentation on Ted Williams. I hope you enjoyed it. And um, I'm going to open it up to questions to Jen, if she can maybe manage that if anyone has any questions okay none yet <laughs> okay but if anybody has any feel free to um feel free to type it in the chat or you could unmute yourself if you like now and um just jump in i hope everyone enjoyed it it was a little bit long but he's a, he's a unique time. character Oh, oh, it was great. It's a, yes, it was great. They enjoyed Thank it. Thank you very much. <laughs> well, let me, before anyone asks a question, I did have the pleasure of meeting Ted Williams once. And in 1991 was the 50th anniversary of um, the historic 406 season. And uh, they had a celebration at Fenway Park honoring both him and Joe DiMaggio. You know, I was there with my dad, and they had, um, you know, a folder, commemorative folder, which I have, and uh, I got him to sign it. I got to meet him, and um, I got to sign it. And think about this, growing up as a child, big Red Sox fan, I mentioned Yastrzemski, who succeeded Williams and left, was my hero. My mother loved Ted Williams, and my father loved Joe DiMaggio. So those conversations over Sunday dinner were very interesting. More, a few more comments. Enjoyed the talk very much. Very Thank informative. You. Thank you. Thank you. Anthony. Yes. Hi. Hi. I just uh, I I just want to throw in that it was very good. Thank you very much. I was working at the Glover in the seventies when Ken Williams came in once, um, and when I say he sucked the oxygen out of the room. <laughs> He didn't say a word. He just walked into the General Glover House with Johnny Pesky, and every person there just 
naturally turned. I've never experienced that type of innate charisma in my entire life, but he was extraordinary. Well, he and was no taller was than about, everybody, too. Yeah, he, he, no one was allowed to wait on him. Only the manager, Iggy, with his white gloves, would wait on him. None of the waitresses. But he was an extraordinary figure when he walked in. No. Yes, he, he was. He was unique. He carried that charisma, and what a dear and great friend Johnny Pesky was to him. Johnny yeah. Pesky lived in the North Shore, lived in Swanscott. What a uh, what a wonderful man! I interviewed him for my master's thesis twenty yeah. years ago, and uh, just a great man. Thank you very much for sharing that wonderful man. Yeah, Johnny memory. Pesky was a great tipper too. He came in on Wednesday <laughs> nights. He was a great tipper. We love Johnny Pesky. There you go. Thank you for sharing that. That's wonderful. This was really interesting, and I want to tell you that my father played table tennis with Ted Williams at the King Cole, uh, King Cole Hotel in Minneapolis. That's when right. He... Oh, I just lost you. Susan, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, we just lost you. I think you just hit, you hit mute. I know I heard table tennis in Minneapolis. Oh, yes. Up. Okay, my father played table tennis with Ted Williams in Minneapolis at the King Cole Hotel. Uh, I guess when, when Ted was in uh, Minneapolis. That's great. So he's That's talked, he talked about me and Ted and I guess Ted lost his temper <laughs> because, <laughs> because of the competitiveness of that game. Sure. Yeah. Sure. I would, I'm not surprised. I am not surprised. Yeah. He had to win at everything. Right. That's great. That's a great story to share. Thank you, Susan. Just You're jumped welcome. in and said you covered it all. My mom loves Ted Williams too. That's great. That's great. Yep, my mother, uh, God bless her, big Ted Williams fan. No one could. Uh, he was on the pedestal, and like I said, my father, being an Italian American, I mean, Joe DiMaggio was his hero, and um, so those were interesting conversations. And I never, I mean, I had Jastrzemski, but I never interjected his name. I just let the two of them yak. <laughs> I was in Washington, D.C. in 1969 when Ted was picked as manager of the, of the Washington Senators, who had, really? had a winning season in a long time. And that year, they won 10 games more than they lost. And they almost beat the Red Sox out for third place in the six-team American League East that year. That's great. And think about it. I mean, you, you were in D.C. during an interesting time. So not only do you have Nixon and Williams, you got Vince Lombardi. So that must have been a one interesting period, yeah. heck of a time to be there. That's great. Thank you. Anybody else? <laughs> okay, well, it looks like we're going to call it a night. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Thank, Thank you. you, Anthony. This was wonderful. Thank you, Jane. Um, Thank you. We're going to talk you up to all the other libraries so they can hire you, too, because you need to <laughs> do this talk everywhere. Well, thank you, everyone, for taking time out of your schedule. Um, I enjoy baseball. I love history and I love baseball. Please be safe um, and uh, God bless. And Jen, thank you as always. Thank, thank you. you we'll talk soon. We'll have you back again real soon. Got it. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.